what am I doing? Uh, making a mess. That's what I'm doing. Oh no, we're going to talk about competition theory. That's right. Very good. Um, so we've, we've talked about population growth. Um, I still want to go back and talk about population density some more, but uh, before we do that, um, I want to talk about competition and predation. Uh, and these two ideas are basically the cornerstone of Darwin's thinking about how nature worked. And these are two of the ideas that led him to this idea of evolution by means of natural selection. So uh, competition theory uh, is a big deal. Um, and I suppose there are two schools of thought concerning competition. Uh, there's one school of thought which, which seems to suggest that uh, everything in, in communities and nature can be understood on the basis of competition. And then there are those uh, that are skeptics and say, well, Maybe not. Okay, um, I fall into that skeptic group, um, and the, the, it's not that I deny the existence of competition, uh, but I don't think that it operates on the same level that people think. So I think it's a question of scale. Um, I have no doubt that competition works, and, and I hope by the end of our discussion here, you'll you'll come away with the same conclusion. That certainly competition works and it has important consequences, um, but perhaps if we put it into context, into scale, then we can better understand how nature works. Uh, so I want to start talking about the theory behind competition, um, and as I mentioned, it's the cornerstone of um, Darwin's thinking, and, it, and if you think about it, under circumstances where resources are limiting, uh, where there's not an infinite supply, uh, then some individuals are going to be better at getting those resources than are others, okay? Um, and what happens to the individuals that are better at getting those resources? Well, they're the ones that live longer and, and uh, produce more offspring. A perfect example of that um, is what's going on with the COVID vaccine right now, okay? If you look at it on a global scale, uh, here we are at the glorious US of A, um, and we're getting vaccinated at a pretty rapid rate. You know, something like, I don't know, what is it, 10% of the population has been vaccinated now? Um, and the assumption is that another 10% of the population has been infected and therefore has some level of immunity. So uh, on some level, we're at 20% you know, protection from this uh, virus. Uh, and when we get to about 80%, then we will have achieved herd immunity. Uh, will we get to 80 percent without a prayer? Okay. Uh, will we get to 80 percent within about 10 years? Oh, absolutely, because all the people that didn't bother to get vaccinated and, and survive the disease will be uh, eliminated as a consequence of natural selection. So ultimately, it all works out. It'll be great. Okay. But if you think about uh, what's happened, for example, in Florida, where Florida has the certain amount of doses that is available. Uh, and what did they do? Uh, what they did was they made the resources, the vaccine, available, you know, first of all, to seniors. Uh, and one of the first things that popped up were these two college kids, that, two young co-eds, um, that drove down to Florida and put on some granny glasses or something and tried to get the vaccine at a drive through center. Now, how do you think that went? Now, maybe you have a hard time imagining uh, what an 80-year-old woman or something looks like, but I can tell you what, you ain't it, okay? That's not what you look like. And of course, they were in right away. This is not, no, you're not 80, I'm sorry. Um, skin's too nice. You know, what's with this blonde hair or, or what's with the lack of wrinkles or whatever it is, you know? So they got found out. Or, also in Florida, um, this uh, this uh, relatively wealthy uh, neighborhood where um, they managed to get a whole host of vaccines uh, to inoculate all of these wealthy people in this gated community. 
you know, and how did they, well, they were pretty good at getting the resources, right? They have all the right connections, they know all the right people, they have all the right bribes and all that sort of stuff. So all these people in this gated community, young, old, whatever, they got the vaccine and the healthcare workers and the teachers and everybody else did not. Okay? So that's competition. Here's this limiting resource, and some people are better at getting that resource than our other people. Okay? So that's just this basic idea. Um, and when we think about competition, uh, it's really operating on two different levels. Now, we can think about it from interest specifically, that is, how you and I compete for resources. Um, and then you can think about it interspecifically, that is, how do we compete for resources with other species? So, if I put, I, I have lots and lots and lots of bird feeders. Um, I have a sunroom and I have all these feeders outside of my sunroom so that when I'm eating my dinner, eating my breakfast, I can watch the birds duking it out over these sunflower seeds that I put out. Uh, and I always use black oil sunflower seeds because that's what the birds want. Okay? And you can watch, there are some birds with, that are really good at getting those sunflower seeds. So the cardinals on some feeders are really good and you know the finches are really good at it and the nuthatches are really good at it the little wrens and the chickadees are not quite so good at it. So if a little chickadee is on the feeder and a starling or something comes by, man, that chickadee is out of there. So there you have this competition, the chickadee species versus the starling species. And the starling is better at getting those resources than is the chickadee for whatever reason, either it's bill shape or behavior or something, right? So when it's two species, there's going to be one species that's better at getting it than the other. Intraspecifically, you have two chickadees, and they're both trying to get the same seeds. Well, one chickadee will be better at it than the other. Or, for example, you and I competing for the vaccine. Some of us are better at getting the vaccine than others. We either know how to game the system, or we're going to be on the phone longer, or know how to make the internet appointment, or whatever it is, or we have connections, or we've got a fat wallet, whatever it happens to be. Some of us are going to be better at getting the vaccine than our others. Okay? Well, if you stop to think about it a little bit, which form of competition do you think is stronger, is more important? The intraspecific or the interspecific? In other words, do you and I compete more strongly for the same resources than do we with any other species? Humans versus dogs, humans versus cats, humans versus cockroaches, humans versus mice, humans versus flower beetles. How, how often have you pulled down a bag of flour from your shelf in your apartment and opened it up, you wanted to make some cookies or something, and holy shit, it's just filled with little beetles. Those damn beetles, it never happens to you. Christ, you go through that shit so fast. I'll buy a bag of flour, it's up there for years, man. Okay, so they get mine. A lot of fried food. <laughs> they get mine. Okay, I'm competing with these flower beetles for my flower. I bought it, damn it, it's mine, and they're getting it. Is that kind of competition stronger, or is the competition where we're both applying for the same job. We're both trying to get the same handout from the government. Or we're both trying to get the same permit to, to shoot an elk in Wyoming. Okay? Which kind of competition do you think is going to be stronger? It's the intraspecific. Okay? And that's because we're more similar to one another. Right? So the intensity of the competition is going to be greater. Fine, the flower beetles get my damn flower, whatever. Okay, I'll go get some more. Um, most of our competition theory wasn't figured out by biologists. In fact, all of the mathematics and most of the theory comes instead from business. Think, for example, 
Consider, for example, two fast food restaurants, Burger King and McDonald's. Now, it's been years since I've gone to either one. When my kids were little, the big deal in fast food restaurants around here was the little play parks, the little playgrounds that they had associated with them, the ball pits and shit like that. You know, my wife is working nights, and I'm trying to keep the kids quiet during the day, so I take them out to a little bunch of parks and stuff, go for a walk or whatever, and then for lunch, we go to Burger King or, or, or McDonald's, right? They would have these ball pits and these games. So back in the day, the McDonald's that's on Broadway, you know, close to King's Highway, that place had a playground, but it was outdoors. And just down the street is Burger King, and they had a ball uh, playground for kids that was indoors. Now it's the middle of summer, where the hell do you think I'm taking my kids? Hell yeah, I'm going to Burger King. I don't care if it's a nickel more expensive at Burger King. That's worth it to me. I can be in air-conditioned comfort. And at the Burger King, they had this little merry-go-round with ponies and stuff on it. They had this big ball pit and this slide and all that good stuff. And it was just a crazy time. It was had by all. And then when you were done and the kids were all worn out, you could go get an Oreo pie or something like that. Just, you know, pig out on sugar and whatnot and fat and grease. It was great. But I decided to go to Burger King, not to McDonald's. So what does McDonald's do? How do they respond? See, at first, fast food restaurants didn't have any of that stuff. And then McDonald's built these little playgrounds outside. And Burger King ups the ante and puts them inside. And then McDonald's ups the ante and puts the one up by Walmart there, and it's like two stories tall or something. So when was the last time you guys went in the ball pit at the fast food restaurant, played around a little bit, went down the slide? You guys don't do that shit anymore? You're too civilized, too mature for that kind of stuff? No, you should go. It's great. They stopped me before I could get in. Yeah. <laughs> they throw me They're absolutely <laughs> disgusting. Mm -hmm. yeah. Like, I can't, it's just sticky. You know? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, now, of course, people are coming to the realization that, yeah, health-wise, maybe not such a smart idea let your kids play and that stuff, because kids are in there puking and oh, yeah. messing their pants and stuff. It's pretty disgusting. Okay. Nice idea, though, right? The point is, right, that these two restaurants, they're trying, what's the resource for the restaurant? Think of the restaurant like a species. What's the resource? Customers. Yeah, the customer dollars. So they're trying to get the customer in the door, okay? Now, what happens if the two restaurants are exactly the same? If they both have exactly the same, exactly the same menu, exactly the same color tables, exactly the same building and everything, but they just have different names, are they both going to make it? Now, why did McDonald's become so popular in the first place? When I, was, when I started college, you could go down to, this was right, you know, McDonald's had just had been around for a while, but it didn't really get popular until I was in high school and in, in college. When I was in college, you could go to McDonald's, right by the junior college where I was going, and you could get a burger with fries and a soft drink for 69 cents. I'm going, fuck yeah, man. Pull out my wallet get change back from my dollar. That used to be the advertising campaign. Change back from your dollar and get a full meal for lunch. So hell yeah. You couldn't make your own sandwich for that much money. Okay? So now imagine here's Burger King, here's McDonald's, everything is exactly the same. The menus are identical. Are they both going to make it? They're not. Why not? Bias. Pardon? Bias. You, you can't tell the difference. We'll call them restaurant A, restaurant A plus, or restaurant 
Billy Restaurant Bob. Okay? They're not going to make it. How do I know? Because they're doing the exact same purpose. Like people are just doing a natural gravity from one of the other. They're exactly the same. Go to Billy's or go to Bob's. It's exactly the same. Prices are the same. Food's the same. Ambiance is the same. Everything is the damn same. There's nothing that distinguishes the two. Which one is going to make it? Probably the general one you went to first or is closest. They're both on opposite corners of the same street in the middle of town. Both easy to get to. If this were a business class, the professor would have failed your ass by now. This is why none of us are in business. <laughs> wait, wait, there's a reason why you're not. Yeah. Because it's boring. <laughs> First? Now we're, we're not at the point yet where we can diversify. So let's think about the process of making that burger. Where does the meat come from? How much do you pay for the meat? How much are you paying your employees? How is it possible that Burger King and McDonald's can sell their food as cheap as they do? Because they're paying their employees slave wages. They're not giving them any benefits as far as I know. Low quality meat. Low quality meat comes from Australia. For years, McDonald's, their burgers, were horse meat coming out of Australia. Because the cattle industry in Australia had collapsed. So all these ranchers in Australia were substituting horse meat for, for beef. And you couldn't tell the difference. Mm -hmm. What does that tell you? Oops. So eat horses. There you go. They weren't doing the beef right. <laughs> yeah, they weren't doing the beef right. So, yeah. so the point is, whoever can put that burger on your plate cheaper and keep the price the same, whoever has the slightly bigger profit margin is the one who's going to win. Because the one who has a slightly larger profit margin has more money to play with to expand and open up more restaurants. And before you know it, you've got a Bob's restaurant in every town in the country, and Bill's restaurant is only in half the towns in the country. Okay? So the one that is more efficient at converting resources, in other words, customer dollars, into new restaurants, that's the one that wins. Let's imagine you wanted to open up your own restaurant, your own fast food restaurant. You say, I hate McDonald's and I hate Burger King. What are you going to do? You're going to try and mimic Burger King and McDonald's? You're going to make a couple dollars. If you try and mimic Burger King and McDonald's, you're going to lose. Because you can't do it the way they do it. You can't do it as cheap as they do. You're going to pay at least twice as much for your meat. Okay? When Burger King or McDonald's buys their beef, they don't buy it by the pound. They buy it by the metric ton. Okay? They're buying in huge... How do you think... How do you think that Walmart is able to make a profit? By volume. Their profit margin is small, but their volume is so large, and they're buying things in such incredible bulk, right, that they can turn a profit. How does Amazon make a, make a profit? Free shipping on everything, almost. How do they pull it off? Everything else that they own. They don't really own anything. They have this website and a bunch of warehouses. And all they're doing, I mean, they don't make anything. All they're doing is they're supplying you with stuff from other people. They're just sort of the middleman. It's this conglomerate. All they do, they're the middleman. Their profit margin is so paper thin. But because everybody does it, 
Bezos went through a divorce, went from the richest man on the planet to the second richest man on the planet. His wife is now the richest woman on the planet. Okay? He's the richest man again. He's the richest guy again? Yeah, he is. It's him and Musk. They keep... The guy from Tesla, what's his name? Elon Musk. Elon Musk. I hate that son of a bitch. <laughs> <laughs> Such a toad. Yeah. God, what a dope. Okay, I'm sorry. I'm letting my personal feelings interfere with my... All right. So uh, there's an interesting, I, I love this story. Um, the, the, automobile industry, the automobile industry is essentially the same sort of story. Think about it, what are the car manufacturers that are out there today? Well, GM, Ford. Well, Ford used to be Ford, Lincoln, and Mercury, but that's all just the same thing now. GM used to be Chevrolet, Pontiac, Oldsmobile, Buick, okay, well that's, it's all the same thing now, the badge on the side of the car is different, but it's all the same damn thing, Cadillac, it's just a Chevy with different badging on it, okay, or um, what other automobile, Toyota, Nissan, Hyundai, Kia, Volkswagen, BMW, Mercedes, Tesla, Ferrari, Ferrari, yeah, all that stuff. Chrysler's Dodge, Jeep, all that sort of stuff. But if you were to go back into the 30s, the number of automobile manufacturers just in the United States was enormous. They were everywhere. And then along comes World War II, and there were no automobiles built between 1946 and 1945. Between, I'm sorry, between 1939 and 1940, or 1942 and 1945. There were no automobiles built. If you look at vehicles that were sold in 1946, they're really just 1942 automobiles that were left over. Okay? Somebody says, hey, I got this awesome 1944 Chevy for sale. You know, they have no clue what they're talking about because there's no such thing. Okay? So at the end of the war, Demand for automobiles went through the roof. If you could build something and call it an automobile, you could sell it. And Henry Kaiser is one of the people that did that. Okay? He built Liberty ships during the Second World War. In fact, he, which were troop transport ships, he was building one ship per day. This is the same Kaiser that's responsible for Kaiser Permanente Medical systems and healthcare and all of that. Kaiser Electronics, Kaiser Aerospace, Kaiser Concrete, all that sort of stuff. He built automobiles up until about 1954, 1955. Then he went broke on automobiles because the market had changed. He got out of competing and he couldn't do it anymore. The Hoover Dam, which dams off Lake Mead, when that thing was built, Henry Kaiser put in the bid to build the dam. And the whole purpose for building that dam was to create jobs and a water supply for Las Vegas and Arizona and Southern California. And Henry Kaiser's bid was so low, and he was going to get the whole damn dam built so quickly that people in the Senate were suspicious. So they had all these Senate hearings. And he had to testify in front of Congress about how this wasn't a scam. And what he was going to do, the way he was able to do it so cheaply, was he was going to make all of his concrete on site. And the equipment that he was going to use was this massive earth-moving equipment and these huge cranes, this monstrous equipment that they were going to build on site. And some guy in the Senate says, well, that's all well and good, but that's not going to create any jobs. So Henry Kaiser says, fine. Tell you what, instead of using all these giant bulldozers and everything, we'll hire 100,000 guys and give each one of them a teaspoon. And we'll dig that damn structure for you. We'll make that dam using teaspoons instead of our heavy equipment. So 
So he makes a job. But then, of course, they relented and said, yeah, well, that's kind of dumb. So he went and got the contract. Okay? The implication was that the whole philosophy that Henry Kaiser had was that the way you make it rich in business is you find some sort of a need, some kind of a niche, and then you fill that need. So he did that in terms of automobiles when he realized there was this pent-up demand for automobiles. He did that when he built Liberty ships for the Second World War, and he did that when he built the Hoover Dam. He recognized this need, and he figured out how to do it, and then he filled that need. Well, that's what species do. There's some niche, some resource that isn't being exploited. Some organism is going to figure out how to exploit that resource. All right. So let's use a biological example. And in fact, the example that we're going to use is from a guy by the name of Gauza. And Gauza, back in the 1930s, did this really cool little experiment. So he's the guy that's responsible for what we refer to as the competitive exclusion principle. And what he did was he had this Petri dish. And in this Petri dish, he put some water. And when he grew these, he, he had two different species of paramecium. He had paramecium caudatum and then paramecium bursaria. And when he grew the two species separately in their individual little petri dishes, he got two very different results. So what he does is he has this petri dish and he fills it up with water. Then every day he puts a little bit of food into the petri dish. And when you do that, he, he then takes this petri dish, and there's a little grid underneath it, and he puts it under a dissecting microscope, and then he, there are little hundred little squares underneath this dissecting microscope, and he'll choose ten squares at random, and then he'll count how many paramecia are in each of those ten squares, and then multiply it times ten. So he comes up with an estimate of how many paramecia are in each dish. When he does that, starting from day 0 to day 20, what he notices for the first species, it has that kind of a growth curve. Well, I'll be dipped in shit. Have you ever seen a growth curve that looks like that before? Ah, uh -huh. that's logistic population growth. He did the same thing for the other species, and he got exactly the same kind of shape. Okay? So when he grows the two species separately in the same food dish, and all he does is add the same amount of food every day. Each species, in their separate food dishes, grows to a certain carrying capacity and stays there. Now, what you would expect when you put them into a mixed culture is something that looks like that. But in fact, that's not the result that you get. In fact, when you put them into the same dish, so both species are now in the same dish. One species starts off growing faster, but it then very slowly goes to extinction. So when he got that result, when they're grown in mixed cultures, he goes, holy smokes. One species always goes extinct. And it's always the same species that goes extinct. Okay? What happened? Why did one species go extinct? They, they're both in exactly the same environment. There's exactly the same amount of food introduced every day. They're just swimming around, minding their own damn business, gobbling up the food. Why does one of them go extinct and the other one survive? What happened? One species, every time it eats a particle of food, it's more efficient at converting that food into new baby paramecia than is the other one. What the hell? I don't want it. I'm not going to restart now. Okay. One of those species is more efficient at converting the available food into new baby paramecia than the other. So one of them 
if population is growing bigger and bigger and bigger, and overall it has a stronger and stronger and stronger advantage over the other species. That's how competition works. Whichever species is more efficient at converting food into new babies is the one that wins. Just like fast food restaurants. Okay? Whichever one is more efficient at converting customer dollars into new restaurants is the one that becomes the dominant force in the industry. Whichever automaker is more efficient at converting customer dollars into market share is the dominant automaker. Okay? So Gauza does this little follow-up experiment. What he does, he takes these same two species and he adds, they're both in the same dish, and he starts the experiment over again, but this time what he does is he adds some crushed glass to the bottom of the Petri dish. And every day he's still feeding them, but he's got that crushed glass at the bottom of the Petri dish. And suddenly, when you do that, Well, when you do that, the graph isn't there. But when you do that, you end up with a curve that looks like that. So simply by adding the crushed glass, the two species are able to persist. Okay? What happens? So if, there are, if it's just the Petri dish, and all you're doing is putting in the food, two species, one of them always goes extinct. Add crushed glass, and they both make it. What's different? The crushed glass. What does the crushed glass do? Prevents interactions. All right, so there are different kinds of competition. There's exploitative competition, which is what we're talking about. That's the competition where we're exploiting the available resources. Then there's the interference kind of competition. That's where we both walk up to the buffet, and I see you coming, and I push you out of the way and stand in front of you so that you can't get to the buffet. That's interference competition. Okay? So we're talking here strictly about exploitative competition. These paramecia, they don't have little arms and boxing gloves and, you know, Taekwondo and all that good stuff. No toxins that they can produce, nothing of that sort. They're just munching away, that's it, sort of sucking stuff in, that's all they can do. So what's different? One's able to get the food from the glass. It turns out that one species prefers open water and the other species prefers being down in the bottom amongst all the crushed glass. So one species is swimming around at the surface, the other one is swimming in the bottom amongst all the rubble. So when food goes into the dish, some of that food drifts down to the bottom amongst all the rubble. And that's the food that's being used by the bottom feeding species. The food that's at the top is being exploited by the, by the paramecium feeding at the top or swimming around at the top. So what you've done is you've taken this habitat and divided it. There are now two habitats. It's not just open water. It's now crushed glass habitat and the open habitat. And one species is primarily in the open habitat. The other species is primarily in the crushed glass. And now suddenly, they're coexisting. So that leads to Gauss's competitive exclusion principle, which states no two species can occupy the same niche at the same time. Okay, memorize that statement. The competitive exclusion principle states that no two species can occupy the same niche at the same time. 
What is a niche? A niche is where an organism lives and what it does. So when we talk about niches, we could say it's the sum total of all resources used by an organism. Another way to think of it is where an organism lives and what it's doing. Okay? So now let's go back and think about our Burger King and McDonald's restaurants. Do they occupy the same niche? In other words, are they exploiting the same customer base? Because if they're using the same customer base, one of them is going to go extinct. All right. Are they exploiting the same customer base? Who here prefers, given a choice, somebody gives you 50 bucks and says, go get yourself some lunch? Where are you going to go? Burger King? or McDonald's. Those are your two options. Okay, you, now it's going to be hard. I don't, you're vegan, whatever, I don't care. Burger King or McDonald's, where are you going? McDonald's. 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 Burger King. Burger King. Thank you. <laughs> Burger King. Burger King. Burger King. Burger King. McDonald's. Okay. We seem to have a difference of opinion here. What's the difference between the two restaurants? Flame roll. Pardon? Flame roll burgers, different fries. One upsets my stomach. So there's, there are differences in the menu. What side of the road they're on? So which one has the sesame seed bun? Burger King. Burger King has this, uh, and the flame broil, which causes cancer, as you know. Well, I should probably don't know, but you will soon enough. So I actually just eat the chicken. <laughs> <laughs> Be honest. Okay. Burger King has the sesame So the menu mm -hmm. items are a little bit different. Are the prices the same? So Burger King is more expensive. Burger King is just a little. It's so Burger King is a little bit upscale. McDonald's is a little bit downscale. More proletarian. Okay, Burger King is more elitist, whatever. Okay? They're not exactly the same. How's about the employees? Are they the same? You think they're the same? Burger King gets paid a little bit more, don't they? Well, when they start out, they used to, anyway. Yeah. I think, I think there are different ethics behind Burger King and McDonald's, you know? Yeah, Burger King wants women in the kitchen. What's that? <laughs> Burger King wants women in the kitchen. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> so what did, whatever happened to Hardee's right now? There used to be, you know where this Marco's Pizza place is? That used to be a Hardee's restaurant there. Whatever happened to that place? It is dead. Pardon? It is dead. Yeah, it, it went under. But why? They were really expensive. Yeah. They were expensive? Yeah, they are. They're more expensive than either Burger King or McDonald's. It's like two dollars more for a burger than burger. And they are even better. Have you did, were any of you guys ever in that that place probably got torn down before you guys were even born? It was a pretty disgusting place. You'd walk in there, you didn't want to do the walk-in, you wanted to do the drive-thru because if you walked in, your shoes would stick to the floor. And you'd walk into the into the little dining room in the back, and it was filled with cigarette smoke because that was the smoking place. If you wanted to eat in there, you could smoke in that side of the building, right? And there'd be all these gimpy old geezers and shit, you know, you know, coughing up phlegm and stuff, smoking their cigarettes, eating their greasy fries, and just talking about, you know, when I was in WW1, you know, and all that sort of stuff. It was awful. And Gary Rust was in there every day, every morning, just hobnobbing with all these gimpy old geezers, you know, the guy that publishes the Southeast Missouri, reading a copy of the St. Louis Post-Dispatch. 
he's the publisher of the Southeast Missouri, and he's reading the St. Louis Post-Dispatch. And sure enough, the next day, in the Southeast Missouri, the stories that he liked out of the Post-Dispatch showed up in the Southeast Missouri in a day late. I think it was amusing. And it was a disgusting place, and they didn't make it, okay? What niche were they trying to fill? They obviously weren't very good at converting the resource, the consumer, into more restaurants. So what did Hardee's do? They bought out Carl's Jr., didn't they? Anybody ever eaten at a Carl's Jr. restaurant? Or too far east? Well, it used to be a big chain out west, you know. But this sort of, this, this sort of downward spiral, they're going extinct, OK? The key is that if you wanted to start a new fast food restaurant, what would you have to do? Something different. Something different, like tacos. Taco Hell or Taco John's or something like that, right? Or name one fast food restaurant that has made it, at least on a local scale. Yeah, but that's a that's a that's a we're trying to do something other than McDonald's or Burger King. Pardon? Yeah, it's sort of a, if you like if you like to clog your arteries and hurt your <laughs> Wendy's? Yeah, it's just more the same. Chick-fil-A. Chick yeah, oh god, don't go to Chick-fil-A. Excuse you, don't even. No, we don't we don't bad mouth Chick-fil-A. <laughs> you love Chick-fil-A, do you? Yeah, it's fantastic chicken. It, it might be, but I refuse to eat at Chick-fil-A and I refuse to go to Hobby Lobby. <laughs> Sorry. It's on the no playlist. Okay. I'm a difficult person. Burritoville. Don't you guys ever go to Burritoville? It's all right. It's higher priced. But you get a lot of food. I'll finish it all, though. <laughs> well, go with somebody else. Get, split a meal with somebody, you know. It's all right. Have a friend. Friends are good. Uh, yeah, I guess. <laughs> all right. The, the, what about what about Stevie's Wonder Burgers down there on Broadway, which is now what? It's now called something else. Across from the down there near the Presbyterian Church thing on the north side, a little shack. Stevie used to be Stevie's Burgers or something. Now it's Ahab's Burgers or whatever it is. Or you guys don't get out much, do you? You just sort of stick around on canvas, wear your mask, hunker down. All right. You should get out more, spend some time outside, and see what's going on out there. Okay, there's some cool stuff. Okay. All right. All right, so the important point, one of the important points is obviously Gauss's competitive exclusion principle. No two species can occupy the same niche at the same time. But there's another component to that. There's another component to that which says that resources must be limited. No. No, cancel. God damn it. What the hell? I'm going to blame this on Vargas. OK, there, there's another aspect of this, and that is the, this idea that resources must be limiting. If resources are unlimited, there is no competition. OK? It's only when resources become limiting that there is competition. The vaccine is limited. There is intense competition for the vaccine. Amongst people trying to get the vaccine, amongst governors trying to get bigger allocations, amongst countries trying to get the vaccine. In the glorious US of A, we've got a lot of vaccine. If you're in Nigeria, not so much. Liberia, the, the Ivory Coast, you got nothing. Yemen, you've got nothing. The West Bank or the Gaza Strip, you've got nothing. Israel is almost fully vaccinated. 
Palestinians got nothing. Okay? So there is competition amongst countries for access to that. So if there's no limiting resources, right, if resources are unlimited, there is no competition. Okay? So let's consider coyotes and wolves, just as a couple of examples. Okay? So there's a nice little coyote. Okay? Um, what's the distribution of coyotes? Where do coyotes occur in the U.S.? Pretty much everywhere. Now they occur pretty much everywhere. Okay, but historically, where were they distributed? Southwest. Southwest. Yeah, the desert southwest. Okay, it's a it's a southwestern species. Where did the wolf used to exist? Northwest, north. Woods. Depends on species. Yeah, so so gray wolf. More in the Everywhere. Yeah. There were there were wolves there were wolves in the Pacific Northwest, wolves all across the Rockies, wolves all the way down the Sierras, wolves in New Mexico, wolves in southern New Mexico, wolves in Mexico, gray wolves in Mexico, gray wolves in Arizona, wolves across the entire U.S. except for the southeastern United States where you have red wolves. Okay. So what happened? People. So there were bounties on wolves, right? There were predator control programs and people killed wolves, right? And they were damn good at it. To the point where now wolves have a pretty restricted range. There's a small population of wolves in southern New Mexico and Mexico, right? And there are the wolves in Yellowstone, in Wyoming, Idaho, northern Idaho, the High Sierras, the northern Rockies, right? And then Canada and Alaska, that's where you get the wolves, okay? And Isle Royale, okay, you get wolves in the Isle Royale. But that's, a, so in other words, at the same time that the wolf population contracted, the coyote population expanded. To now, the most common roadkill in Los Angeles is coyote. Now, you can see coyotes in Cape Girardeau on a regular basis if you're paying attention. They're all over the damn place. Out there at the airport, <clears throat> all the time. Okay? So what happened? There was a, a, a niche that needed to be built. So suddenly, you have these wolves which are no longer exploiting this resource, this resource becomes available, and now the coyotes are moving in to take that resource. Okay? What's the difference between coyotes and wolves? How are they different as, as canids? They're both dogs, right? Well, what are, what's the difference between them? Wolves are packs. Wolves are social. Okay? They're a lot bigger. The head on a wolf is the size of a basketball. The paw on a gray wolf is about the size of two of your hands. They're massive. They're big damn animals. Okay? A wolf can easily exceed 120 pounds. They're tough as damn nails. There's some, glori there's some glorious helicopter footage of these in Yellowstone of these wolves killing an elk. And they're running this elk for 24 hours. They're chasing this elk for 24 hours through the snow before they finally run it down. The wolves are careful because, man, if you get too close to that hoof, you're going to get your head caved in. So they're really careful. And what they do is they'll, go up, they'll just take a little bite on the side of the animal and then hold back. They just want to get the animal to bleed. Let it bleed, let it bleed, let it hurt, let it get sore, let it get tired. And they'll run it for 24 hours straight. And a wolf has no problems running 24 hours straight. And finally that elk is going to fall down, and they're going to swarm him and tear chunks out of him. The elk is going to get up, try and run a little bit more. They'll let it go, they'll run it down again. Until finally, after 24, 30 hours, they're finally going to kill that damn elk. And they're going to gorge themselves on that elk. 
And then they're going to return to the alpha pair, which didn't participate in the hunt, and they're going to regurgitate everything they ate for the alpha pair and their pups. And after the alpha pair has eaten what they regurgitated, they will go back to that elk and finish it off for themselves. Awesome damn animals. God, they're awesome. They're just these killing machines. It's just so... <laughs> so cool. No, not now. <laughs> it's, I'm going to blame Vargas. Compared to coyotes. So elks, I mean wolves are eating elk, wolves are eating snowshoe hares, they're eating tourists, they're eating whatever the hell they want, whatever they can get. What do coyotes eat? Small things. Mice, rabbits, birds, garbage. In Los Angeles, you have to have coyote-proof trash cans. Because the coyotes in Los Angeles have figured out the trash runs by the city. They know exactly what streets on what days get their trash picked up. And the coyotes go through the night before, knocking over all the trash cans and going through the garbage. They're awesome. They're exploiting this resource. They're able to make it in L.A. County, 14, together with 14 million people, and they're making it. Of course, they eat Fido and Fifi. The person that lives catty corner behind me used to have a little chihuahua. They'd let it out every night to go you know, do his business, go poop and pee and whatnot. They just open up the back door, let him go out, always at the same time. One night, I hear this yipping, this frantic yipping, and then I hear these kind of howls and whatnot. A coyote got that little chihuahua. <laughs> Y'all can be sort of a Mexican South Southwestern flavor to it. It was great. Now maybe it'll leave us alone. All right, so the coyotes have expanded their range at the same time that the wolf range has contracted. Let's think about Ah, there we are. Imagine that. So there's a wolf, right, doing its little vocalization thing. Coyotes are are solitary, sometimes they hunt in pairs. Some people out west, these ranchers, they claim that the coyotes are taking their 1,500 pound steers and whatnot. How much does a coyote weigh? 40 pounds. 40 pounds is a big coyote, and they're, they're roughly 35 pounds. They're like a small, medium-sized dog. That's it. They're tall and lanky. This is not, I mean, you're walking down the street and a coyote comes after you. It's, it's an annoyance, but it's not a life-threatening event, okay? A couple of kicks and you're done with him. You know he's going to scamper off or something. It's not a big deal. So if you're going to try and convince me that coyote is going to take down your 1,500-pound steer, you're not going to convince me. It ain't going to happen. Now, your steer breaks his leg and gets injured and is sick and is laying out in the pasture, yeah, the coyote is going to go help himself, right? But the coyote isn't going to kill the steer. All right. So what we need to do is we need to think a little bit about this in more of a conceptual way. And what I want to do is think about it using this diagram. So here we have what's referred to as the supply curve, the resource availability curve. Okay? 
So this curve, it, whatever this resource is, it might be seed size, it might be temperature, it might be whatever, okay? Whatever the resource happens to be. That's this axis. Here's the availability of that particular resource. All right. Each curve down here represents a resource utilization curve. So these smaller curves here are the resource utilization curves. Each one for a different species. So in this system, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven species. Okay? If you add all of those resource utilization curves together, this dashed line here, that's what's being used. Notice the difference between the supply and the demand curve. Okay? Those are available resources. So in this example, resources are not limiting. In this example, there is no competition. Competition only happens when resources are limiting. In other words, when the demand curve is equal to the supply curve. So let's imagine you were in this scenario. You can think of each of those curves as being the niche for the species along this one resource axis. So if this is the niche, vaccine availability, food availability, whatever it happens to be, if this is the niche, if this is the resource axis, each of these represents a niche for a different species. Where those niches overlap, right there, that's where you have potential competition. If that's McDonald's and that's Burger King, those are the customers that overlap between the two. Okay? That's, if there is competition, that's where the competition is going to occur. Going back to automobiles, after the Second World War, the supply right, was extremely limited. Okay? The demand was outrageous. So anybody that could build an automobile could sell it. But as the market matured, and as the pent-up demand for automobiles sort of dissipated, competition got intense. The automobile companies that survived were the ones that were able to build automobiles most efficiently, the ones who could get more profit out of every car. So when General Motors was buying steel, they got it for a much better price than did Packard or Studebaker or Kaiser or Fraser or Willys or any of those other car makers. Although those car makers couldn't compete. They couldn't do it as efficiently, as cheaply as General Motors or Ford Motor Company. And for that reason, they ultimately went extinct. The same is going to be true here. When resources become limiting, that's where the competition is intense. What do you expect natural selection to do? What should the end result of that be? Run that by me again. A balanced demand supply curve. Where yeah, so have ul exceeded or ultimate, ultimately the species are going to figure out a way to exploit all of the resources. That's true. Adaptation. Okay, adaptation. How is that adaptation going to be reflected here in these niches? Specialized. Yeah, they're going to become specialized. In other words, your niche gets narrower. Let's think of examples of that. Let's compare 
an animal that lives in the tropics versus an animal that lives in the temperate zone. Okay? In the tropics, you have bees that only feed on one kind of orchid. That's it. In the tropics, you have capybaras that specialize on seeds of the guanaco tree. And that's all they eat. They're specialized on one particular thing. In the tropics, you have plants that grow only under these very narrow, precise conditions and nowhere else. If you think about diversity of life, where is the diversity greater, in the tropics or here? In the tropics. In the tropics. And the question is, why? Why? They diversified their... They, they just they became different from one another. They diversified, they acted. Yeah, but why, do, why doesn't that happen in the temperate zone? There's seasonality in the temperate zone. Because in the temperate zone, life is unpredictable. In the tropics, it's highly predictable. Yeah. So in the tropics, everything is the same all the time. I mean, clearly there is some, a very little bit of seasonal variation. But if you, but think back to those biome graphs, the temperature variation, the precipitation variation, it's all pretty constant. In other words, everything is really predictable. And when things are predictable, you can become very specialized. You do one thing and one thing only. Okay. In the temperate zone, let's think about what happened this winter. How is this winter different from typical winters? It was insanely cold. It was cold. We got more snow than we normally get. We got this incredibly warm day today. What the hell is up with that, right? We got snow in Denver, and we've got, you know, like t-shirt weather and stuff. That's sort of silly, okay? In other words, here, it's really unpredictable from one year to the next. What does that mean? That means these species in an unpredictable environment have to be pretty generalized. Because if you don't know what's coming next, you better be prepared for whatever it happens to be. All right. Let's think about arctic foxes, gray foxes, and red foxes. What's the fox that you see most commonly on campus? Red foxes. Red foxes. How many people here have seen a gray fox? Nobody? You need to get out more. How many people here have seen an arctic fox? One person. You need to get out more. Okay? You need to go north. You want to see Arctic. So what's different about Arctic foxes and red foxes? Pardon? They they are white, at least in the at least in the winter. During the summertime, they're they're silver. Okay? Silver and gray. Where do red foxes come from? Yeah. From where? Here or in like the Pacific Northwest? I'm going to guess. I'm guessing. So when the British got here, would they have encountered red foxes? They would not have. Red foxes are whole Arctic. So the red foxes would have been all across Canada into Alaska, right there with Arctic foxes. But the difference between Arctic foxes and red foxes is simply that the Arctic foxes can handle temperatures that are much lower. So the Arctic foxes are able to exploit the extreme cold that the red foxes can. So how do we get red foxes down here in the southern 48? It's the British brought them. Because when the British got here, the only foxes that were here were the gray foxes in this part of the country were the gray foxes. What do gray foxes do that red foxes don't? They climb. 
So the British come here and they want to do their fox hunt. They're on their horses and they got their hounds and they're running through the forest and whatnot. And the, and the dogs pick up some fox and they're howling away and going after the foxes. And they're all riding through the forest and then they go, where the hell are the foxes? And the great foxes went straight up into the trees and everybody goes behind them, underneath them. They come down the tree and they go the other way. They could never catch the foxes. So because they couldn't successfully hunt their foxes, they said, all right, well, that's stupid. We still want a fox hunt. The next ship over, they brought a whole bunch of red foxes from England. So all the red foxes that we have here were introduced from England. So it's a weed species. That's why you get red foxes in town. What the hell's up with that? Okay? Go to West Park Mall. Yep, red foxes out in the parking lot. There it is. Go to a picnic at Arena Park. Yep, there's a red fox. You know, hitting your popcorn or something like that. They're all over the damn place. Are they using the same resources? Do red foxes and gray foxes and arctic foxes use the same resources? They don't. Okay? They're using different resources and they're using them in different ways. The resources are not just food, but the resources are habitat too. So the arctic foxes are in much colder climates than are the red foxes. The gray foxes are up in the trees and on the ground. The gray foxes are eating all sorts of things, right? Red foxes are more generalized. Gray foxes and arctic foxes are more specialized. Have you guys ever seen how an arctic fox hunts? How they, how they just nosedive into the snow? It's such a cool thing. What's interesting, though, is that that's a standard canid behavior. It's not just the arctic foxes that do that. Red foxes do it. Dogs do it. Yeah, if you have a border collie, or if you have an Australian shepherd or something like that, I don't know about poodles or greener dogs, but if you have a working dog, working dogs will go through exactly the same behavior, just dive head first into the snow. They'll listen, they'll hear something, and they'll die for it. And oftentimes they get it. Right? All right, so the point is that species like Arctic foxes, right, have the ability to exploit certain resource axes that aren't available to other species. So even if you're eating the same food resources, one way to avoid competition is to use those food resources in a different habitat. Okay? So when you look at that Arctic fox, what do you notice? What does this animal do that makes it possible to live in these extreme cold conditions? Small ears. Small ears. Why are short little small ears important? Yeah, so less chance of frostbite. This guy is going to be out there when it's minus 80 degrees centigrade. Okay? What else do you notice? Chunky. He's not chunky, he's fluffy. <laughs> okay? He's got a really thick boundary layer around him by that, by that pelt. Okay? What else? Yeah, which is sort of weird, right? It's like, it's like polar bears are white. What the hell is that all about? I mean, talk about dumb. Proof that God exists and he's jerking us around a little bit. Okay? Why are polar bears white? Pardon? Why would you, you want to absorb the sunlight? It's goddamn cold out there, man. Give me some warmth. Why are polar bears white? They should be black. Why aren't they black? What are they blending in for? Who's hunting polar bears? They're not. They're not hunting. They're hunting seals. Yeah. So, so what difference? So you could be purple and be just as successful at hunting seals because the seals are below the ice. The seal looks up and all the seal sees is a shadow. Doesn't make any difference whether the purple, if the animal is purple, green, pink, yellow, polka dotted, whatever. The shadow is the damn same. 
So why be white? The polar bear is not sneaking up on anybody. The polar bear is waiting. There's a seal. Let's punch through that ice and kill that sucker. Is it that they don't want to absorb heat because the purpose is heat retention, not heat absorption? No, they're, they're, they're concerned about temperature. When it's minus 80 degrees, uh, you're aware of it. It hurts to breathe at minus 80. So why are they white? It hurts to breathe at minus 40. Is there less resource investment in pigmentation? I don't know. Does it cost to make melanin? It turns out that polar bears are really black. So if you put the polar bear pelt underneath the spectrophotometer, it behaves as though it was black. So it looks white, but it's behaving as though it's black. So the, spectro, the spectrophotometer says that sucker is black. And you're looking and saying, no, that's white. No, it's black. So it's absorbing. One of the things it does is it has hollow hairs. And if you look at the skin underneath the fur, it's dark. It's not white. It's dark. So they're cheating. This guy does this cool thing. If you were to stick a thermometer on those paws, that paw would be 4 degrees centigrade. The core of his body is going to be 37. It's minus 80 outside. His paws are at 4 degrees. What's the temperature of the snow he's walking on? Like negative something. Negative 6, negative 8. It's, it's, it's relatively warm compared to minus 80, right? Because once it's frozen, that's where it's staying. Okay? So this guy, blood is coming down there, and it's cooling down to 4 degrees, and then that 4 degree blood is going to return to the core of the body? No. He takes the vessel, which is going down to the paw, like that, and the return vein lays right next to, is touching the artery that's going down. So as the blood returns, all the heat from the artery going down is being dumped into the return supply. It's being used to warm up the blood that's going back to the core. So that by the time the blood gets up to the shoulder, it's back to 37 degrees. That's why his paw is 4 degrees. Because all the heat is being transferred into the return blood supply. So he's got ice cold little paws, but the core of the body is 37. So he's nice and toasty. Red foxes don't do that. That's why this guy is able to get and be out and about. It's minus 80, and the red fox is going, screw that, I'm down in my little hole here. We'll wait till it warms up. And then, obviously, the glorious gray fox. Gray foxes are weird. Okay? If you think about the evolution of canids, who is the ancestral canid? Canids are the dogs. Wolves? Don't think wolves are wolves. Not wolves. It's that thing. These guys. These are the basal canids. So this is what all the other canids came from. This is the first branch that comes off the canid tree, is the gray foxes. There are two species. You're assigned Scenario argentius, which is our gray fox, and then you're assigned Litteralis, which is the island fox. These guys are arboreal, they climb trees. The island foxes, there are no trees, so they don't climb. And they're smaller. But that's the primordial canid. So these guys are not closely related to all the other foxes. So foxes are divided into the Eurocyon clade, and then the vulpine clay, which is all the things like the red fox, okay, those guys, and the arctic foxes. And then you have all those South American foxes, which are in a different clay. All right. So here's the rub now. We've talked about, we've been talking about what resource axis. And maybe that resource axis is seed size or something like that. 
it's possible that there are multiple resource axes. So we've been looking, just look at this axis right here in the back. Here you have this axis, and this might be seed size. So these are little seeds, and these are big seeds. So here's one species, maybe it's a finch, and it's eating little seeds. And here's another species of finch, which is eating big seeds. And here's where the competition occurs. So if resources are limiting, right here, that's where these guys are competing for seeds. And it turns out that animals with little jaws eat little things. Animals with big jaws eat big things. So finches with little beaks eat little seeds. Finches with medium-sized beaks eat medium-sized seeds. Finches with big beaks eat big seeds. So here, that's where the competition is occurring. If resources were limited, what would you expect to happen? What you would expect is these guys that are competing are going to have less reproductive success because they don't have as much food as the other guys. Why? Because they have to share it with this other species. So competition is operating right there. That's where natural selection is operating. What should the end result of natural selection be? What should happen to the amount of overlap right here? It should be reduced. Should be reduced. So natural selection should reduce the amount of overlap between species. That's what you expect to see. But it gets complicated because this is seed size. Maybe this is some moisture gradient. So here are dry conditions and here are wet conditions. And here are the same two species, species A and species B. And this one is in dry conditions and this one is in wet conditions. And there, look, they have overlap. But now, when you look at it in the three-dimensional space, you say, boy, that's a lot of overlap. Man, that's a lot of overlap. But now you look at it in three dimensions, and it's not very much. And it gets worse. It always gets worse. Because here we're looking just at the basic floor plan. What if the resources are correlated? Well, if the resources are positively correlated, here's species A, there's species B, so you're going to have a huge area of overlap. In other words, if, that, if, there, if the resources are positively correlated, here's seed size, and here's moisture, Now you've got a large area of overlap. But if the resources are negatively correlated, now you've got no overlap. Holy shit. This is going to get complicated. This is going to be an absolute mess, okay? All right, let's look at a few more examples. What we're going to do is we're going to make our lives easier by thinking about it in a slightly different way. We're going to look at this whole problem by thinking about it in terms of population growth and using some very simple mathematical models. So instead of trying to go through all that, are the resources positively correlated, negatively correlated, how many resource dimensions are there, we're going to look at it in a slightly different way, and that will simplify our thinking a little bit. But let's, before we do that, let's consider a few additional examples. First, I want to talk about primates, chimps, gorillas, lemurs, and orangutans. So let's look at this chimpanzee. 
what's the thought that goes through your mind when you're looking at a chimpanzee? So, first of all, who are the chimpanzees in relationship to us? Pretty, pretty close they, they, they are pretty close relatives, right? I mean, they are, they are, there, there is a, we, we share a common ancestor with the chimps, okay? And if you look at them, what's the difference between them and us, aside from the fact that they have a lot more body hair than we do? Well, my son almost has that much body hair. My son is a really hairy guy. It's kind of scary. Well, my son doesn't have quite that, you know, brow ridge there, but okay. what's different about the chimpanzee compared to us? Let's just look at the head. I mean, the fingers are basically the same, maybe not your fingers, but those look like mine, okay? Mm -hmm. What's different about the head, the face of that, the head of that guy compared to you? Let's begin by asking the question, man, that's a perfect set of teeth. And I'll bet you he didn't go to an orthodontist. How many of you had orthodontic work done when you were a kid? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay? Yeehaw. That was fun, wasn't it? It was great. Why, why the hell did you need orthodontics? Oh, my teeth were all kinds of messed up. Spun around. Yeah, they were all over the damn place. Circus. How did, how did that happen? What? There wasn't enough room in our mouth. There wasn't enough room. Why not? Because it's getting smaller. We're supposed to kind of look like that. <laughs> this guy has got plenty of room. You've got the same number of teeth that this guy has, but you've got this flat little face. I mean, it's cute, but it's flat. This guy's face is sticking out there. He's got plenty of room. And the other difference is, where's the rest of his head, man? It's not there. He's got this little tiny head, and by comparison, you've got this big ass head sitting up there. So we've sort of flipped it. There's, we think there's a gene that controls allometry, and it's an on-off gene. And it determines, you throw that switch, and the development of one structure continues or stops. And what happens in chimpanzees is the switch that controls growth of the cranium turns off very early in life. So the back of the head stops growing, but the front face keeps growing. When these things are born, they look just like human babies. But the back of the head stops growing really early in life, and the face keeps growing. What happens in us is our head, the switch is going in the other direction, our head keeps growing, and the face stops growing really early in life. So we end up with this flat face and this gigantic head. Is there an advantage to having a flat face? No. But that's just the way it worked. That's the way it happened, and it seems to work. Okay? There, but for that gene, Go you and I. We don't have quite as much hair as these guys do, right? Our hair patterns are different, but essentially we're the same. So people, when they talk about homosexuality and all of that sort of stuff, alternative lifestyles, they get all bent out of shape for all sorts of different reasons. It ain't natural and all that kind of stuff. Bonobos practice sex. They don't practice it with members of the opposite sex. They practice, the males practice it with other males. So there are, you know that there's this innate behavior pattern where these animals are doing that sort of stuff. It's a part of learning the appropriate behavior. They're figuring it out. They're not walking around with little pride flags or anything when they're doing it. Okay? Nobody's saying, well, that's weird, or anything of that sort. It's just a very natural sort of thing that they do. They're just learning. Compare that with gorillas. 
looks a lot like some football players I've seen. Okay, big, bulky kind of guy. The cool thing about gorillas, they are somewhat more distantly related to us. But the cool thing about these guys is that a lot of their behaviors are just like yours. Have you ever seen a gorilla with a baby or an orangutan with a baby? A new baby? Oh, they, they hold them in exactly the same way. They show them off. They're all proud and everything. You can see all those sorts of the same behaviors that we go through, they go through. There's this perfect story of, of uh, George Schaller. He's in Africa. He's working with the mountain gorillas. And he's in this little clearing, he's found this baby gorilla. And he picks it up, and he's walking through, walking around, trying to look for the troop to which this infant belongs. And he finds this troop of gorillas across this clearing, and he just stands there on the side of the clearing, holding this little baby gorilla. And the silverback male sees him. And that silverback male starts running at George Schaller. And George Schaller knows behavior. He just stands there holding this thing, and he waits until a gorilla, and this gorilla is huge, just knocking down trees, grunting on, and just, and if this gorilla hits George Schaller, he will kill George Schaller. And this gorilla is just running, and George Schaller waits until about the guy is 10 yards away, puts his head down, and holds the baby out like that. The gorilla stops, picks up the baby, turns around, walks off. How many of you could do that without soiling your pants? We would all mess it up, okay? But George Schaller understood enough about behavior, right, to figure out it as an example. For you guys, it doesn't work for the, for the girls. If you're a guy, next time you go to a crowded shopping center, whatever, here's what I want you to do, especially on a Friday night when all those teenage boys are walking around trying to look hard and stuff. Go in the opposite direction. Just keep your hands out of your pockets. And just look at some guy and make eye contact. Okay? And if the guy's smaller than you, don't break eye contact. If he's smaller than you, just watch what he does. Don't smile, don't sneer. Neutral face, just look at him straight in the eyes. And what that smaller guy is going to do, he's going to look down, he's going to look away, just, hi, you know, one of those sorts of things. He's going to break eye contact and look down. If it's a guy that's bigger than you, watch what he does. If he's bigger than you, watch his hands and watch his elbows, because his hands are going to go like that, and his elbows are going to bend. And it's going to take every ounce of courage that you have in your body not to say, hey, hi, and look away. Okay? Because if you don't, he's going to start swinging. It's exactly what gorillas do. By looking down, by breaking eye contact, you're indicating submission. Remember when you were in high school and you had all those staring contests with people? That's a dominance contest. You're trying to find out who's dominant. You're trying to figure out what is the dominance hierarchy. Who's the alpha? Who's the beta? Who's the gamma? That's what it all is. Okay? Orangutans, right? I mean, that's a pretty human-looking animal, okay? I mean, not very attractive, but it is a pretty human looking at. And these guys are just incredibly human like in their behaviors and all of that sort of stuff, right? Morphologically, their skeletons are a little bit different because they're arboreal, you know, brachiators. But aside from that, they are, in all of their behaviors, they're very human like. Notice what happens in primates. Every, notice how these guys, notice how the face is set off. All this beautiful fur out there, and here's this isolated face. Why do that? Expression. Facial expressions. There, a lot of communication that takes place in primates is nonverbal. Okay, 
just as in you guys, in you ladies, when you're getting ready for a date with somebody that you're really interested in, what do you do? You put on makeup, and a lot of your makeup concerns what part of your face? Your eyes. What are you trying to do with your eyes? Seducing. Do what? Seducing. Yeah, but but what is it? What are you doing to your eyes? I mean, what? You're trying to make them look bigger. You're trying to make them look bigger. Why are you trying to make them look bigger? Because of what? Because of. Those aren't particularly big eyes. No, but the ridges around them make your your eyes look this eyes. Yeah. And then we get to the staring dominance thing. So you've got these things, which, I mean, if you've been with somebody for a while, you know exactly what they're thinking by what's going on with their eyebrows and so on, right? With their facial expressions. You're pretty good at that. But why do you make your eyes look so big? What's, what are you doing? All right. Who doesn't like kittens? Everybody loves kittens. How about little puppy dogs? Everybody loves little puppy dogs. How about little baby bunnies? Everybody loves little baby bunnies. Why do people love little baby bunnies, puppy dogs, and kittens? Because they've got these huge ass eyes. What do little babies have? Huge ass eyes. When you were an infant, your eyes were effing huge. Everybody's looking, oh, what glorious eyes. How cute. And what happened was, because it's a sensory system, it stayed, it's essentially the same size today as it was when you were born, and the rest of your head is grown around it, and now you don't have the same, oh, how cute factor that you did when you were an infant. So when you're making up your eyes, you're trying to get that, oh, how cute response. And it works. Okay? It doesn't work for guys. Okay? So then, anybody know what animal that is? Ringtail ring lemurs, man. Why are ringtail lemurs so effing awesome? Strike tails. Yeah, strike tails. That's that's cool. But they'd be they'd be awesome even if the tails were solid color. They're really good at jumping. They're they're what? They're really good at jumping. They're really good at jumping. What they're else? The, they're the old world monkeys. They're the Original, most original. There they are in Madagascar, right? They are all all lemurs are restricted to the island of Madagascar. Okay, so in an evolutionary sense, they are the primordial primate. Notice the body form. The head looks very much like a like a tupiat. Okay. So it almost looks squirrel-like. The body is almost squirrel-like. The tail is almost squirrel-like. So it's this primordial, arboreal kind of a body form. Like a squirrel, only it's a primate. This is the group. The lemurs are the primordial group of primates. Everything else comes from that particular clay. Okay. The cool thing is that in terms of behavior, if you're interested in the evolution of behavior, this is where everybody starts, working on lemurs. At the San Diego Zoo in, in California, they have examples of every lemur species on the planet, and they have this huge research program on lemur behavior. Why? Because understanding lemur behavior gives you insight into human behavior. But in terms of the complexity of and it's a social species, right? That's the other cool thing about so many primates, is they're social. So many of them are social. Not all, but so many of them are social. All right, that's where we're going to stop. Uh, next time, well, we can talk about penguins and so on. We're going to skip all that. Um, next time, what we'll do is we'll get into the mathematics of competition theory a little bit. Not too deeply, but a little bit. So you have your data sheets, right? You're free to start working on your project. I will hopefully get you information about doing this um, questionnaire thing before you get started. If not, just go ahead and get started. I will try and get that up before Wednesday, okay?
Otherwise, I will see you guys next, next Monday, I guess, right? No, in two Mondays. Sorry? Not this Wednesday, but the following Wednesday. There you go.